Okay. Learn to go back to. Oh, and completely dog barking in the background. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, understanding the English chapter one because um, this is not going to all be covered in the next hour. <laughs> this is sort of the, uh, I guess, the top ten things that you need to know about English culture. And um, hopefully we'll whet your appetite to, um, to learn more. And after today, I will circulate a list of books that I recommend to help you understand uh, more about the English as well. So, so the first thing to, um, to take on board is that I'm not talking about British people, I'm talking about English people, okay? So British people are people who come from Great Britain, which is the yellow part, Scotland, green part of England and the pink part of Wales. So that is Great Britain. And over here in the orange, we've got other orange, <laughs> we've got Northern Ireland. And when you add Northern Ireland to these three, you get the United Kingdom. So if you think of Great Britain as this great big island <laughs> and the United Kingdom is when there is sort of the, the Great Britain and, and Northern Ireland. So, um, so they are four different countries that add up to make one combined country of the United Kingdom. But most people would say that they were either Welsh first or Scottish first or English first, and then they are British. So British refers to coming from Britain or the UK, it's used for both. But if you call a Scotsman English, they would be very insulted. And a bit like, um, you know, calling an American a Canadian or, or vice versa. So, um, um, so it's very important to make that distinction if you are talking to, to people from Scotland or Wales. They are, they are never English, they are Welsh and Scottish. So, and to, similarly, people from the Republic of Ireland, that's this area here, the grey, they are never British, they are Irish from the Republic of the Island of Ireland. So um, important just to be aware of those distinctions. <laughs> so I want to talk through some English characteristics, first of all, and there's about half a dozen of them. And then I'm going to look at how these manifest themselves in the workplace and how they will sort of impact and influence the behavior of both your manager and your colleagues. And, um, and things that you might want to take on board to think about your own behavior and the impact that it might have on others around you. So the first one that I think every, and it says here what the British say, but I'd say what they really mean is what the English say, because the English are so good at being indirect. They are absolute masters of not really saying what they mean. And it's, horribly confusing for people from other countries and particularly from countries such as Germany, um, many of the Eastern European countries, um, Holland, where in, in France too, that they will tell you exactly what they think and rather than saying, oh yes, I really like your idea and then not intending to do anything about it. So I will share this slide with you as well. Obviously it's meant to be a, a bit of a joke, but you can see that when an English person says something like, you know, well, you tell them your idea and they say, well, with the greatest respect, what he really means is, I think you're an idiot, but what others understand quite understandably is that it means, oh, he's listening to me and he thinks my idea is, is quite good. So, and quite good, you know, mm, quite good, not really very good at all. It's a bit disappointing, but, the person from another country would say, mm, quite good, that means quite good. And one of the words that we are famous for saying that is often misconstrued is interesting. So somebody comes along with an idea for doing something and the English person will say, hmm, interesting. And what that really means is that's the worst idea I've ever heard, but I'm going to be very polite and say that it's interesting. So one of the things you have to master is being able to read between the lines, to read what's not being said, to hear what is not being said as well as what is being said. So one of the reasons for being indirect, it sort of goes hand in hand with this being modest, which British people really like, English people, British people, they like to downplay 
achievements. Uh, they don't want to hear people saying, oh, I'm really good at this. I was top of the class or, you know, I was fantastic at this job. You know, everybody wants to hire me. Um, they don't like people who seek the spotlight for themselves. They want people who are part of the team and they value all team members equally. So the sort of self deprecating style of many English people is um, is something that you no doubt see a crop will see, you know, people will downplay their achievements and they say, oh, you know, I, I don't have a very important job. I, I just work in banking or something like that. Well, actually, you know, they are the CEO of Barclays Bank or something quite senior. So but it is not considered well mannered to be too boastful of your achievements and um, England and um, or Britain and America were described once as as two countries um, divided by a common language. And there are many mistakes between Americans and English people who the Americans sort of, you know, think, well, I speak English, you know, I'll be fine. What, what's there to, to be difficult about that? But the whole way that the Americans behave and self promote in a way that is very acceptable in America is really not seen as acceptable here and Australia, um, America, oh, British people find it quite offensive the way that Americans are in sort of sell mode all the time and trying very hard to sort of push themselves. So when you're talking to people, you know, wait to be asked for more detail. Don't try to sort of force your information about yourself sort of at somebody, just sort of, you know, hint at what you do and then the conversation will develop and, and they will ask you more if they're interested. Humour is also really important to master and that can be difficult for people who are um, you don't have English as a first language because jokes can often go wrong. I'm just going to move the jokes can often go wrong when you try to tell them in a second language. So um, this is very typical English humour, this sign on the left. So rather than sort of putting a sign up with a sort of fat person in a swimsuit and a big you know, red circle with a line through it, it's actually, well, let's you know, we don't want to be unkind to people, but let's sort of make a bit of a joke about it. And let's say, you know, in a very lighthearted way, you know, that when it's hot, please dress for the body you have and not the body you want. Because basically people in this town were saying like, you know, please, it's offending our eyes, all these people walking around in little tiny shorts and strappy tops. So, so people use humour to get a point across that they, is a serious point and they want the point to be conveyed, but they don't want people to be offended. And it's actually too important a point to sort of say it seriously because then you genuinely would cause offense. I mean, imagine if they put a sign up basically saying, you know, fat people have got to cover up, you know, that's not gonna happen. So this is a clever way of basically getting sort of the point across. So, so people will often use it in the workplace to diffuse tension. So if two people are arguing about something and it's getting a little bit heated, a third person might say, OK, I'll book a boxing ring down the road and you can take your argument there afterwards. But the rest of us are just going to go and get a cup of tea or something like that. Or, you know, they make a joke to in order to sort of turn the temperature down a little bit. They also use it to mock people who are self-important. So like Americans sort of saying, you know, oh, I was top of the class. And then an English person might say, wow, top of the class. Was that kindergarten or primary? So they you know, just sort of tease them and, and mock them for being too earnest. So, and, and of course they also use it to pretend that things are not as serious as they might be. So um, all this stuff that going on at the moment about um, whether Keir Starmer ate a sort of curry and, and whether Boris Johnson sort of, you know, had a birthday cake. The British papers have given these all very light-hearted sort of scandal names, you know, so there's curry gate and there's cake gate and things like that. And, you know, these are serious issues, but they are treated lightheartedly in the British press to actually sort of downplay the importance of them and to, and to pretend that they are not as serious as, as they are, as they actually are. So. Um, being stoic, so just putting up with things, that's also very English. So 
Um, they're not really putting up with it. What they're doing is they're pretending that they're putting up with it. So they fall over and, you know, there's a big gash in their leg and, oh, it, it's nothing, you know, don't worry about it. And and actually when things are going badly and someone says, oh, you know, how are you? And and how is, you know, your wife with your with her terminal cancer? Oh, well, you know, mustn't grumble. You know, she's not doing too badly. And actually this whole thing of sort of the English way is not to make a fuss and not to grumble about things. So, and, and to sort of, um, to, to downplay things that are quite serious and could be quite worrying. So I don't know if any of you have heard of this phrase to, to maintain a stiff upper lip. You know, when you, when you cry and your lips sort of wobble. So the idea is that you, by maintaining a stiff upper lip, it's like, no, just always put a stern face on things and, and carry on. So, um, and, and this is also part of not being a nuisance to people. So you don't make a fuss about things because you don't want to be a bother to anyone else. So if you've got some really bad stuff going on, but you don't want to bore other people telling them about it, you think that, well, they've asked, but they're probably not really interested. So I don't want to bother them with all my problems. So, you know, I, I would rather actually just sort of grumble about it and complain about it a bit um, and, uh, and, you know, and just get on with worrying about it on my own. And part of not being a nuisance is always saying sorry for things, even when it's not your fault. So this is a very English sort of habit that somebody steps on my toe when I'm in the supermarket and I immediately say sorry for having been standing in the wrong place and therefore causing them to stand on my foot. So <laughs> um, there's, a, there's if any of you are on Twitter, there's a good handle called Very British Problems and uh, it, it um, cites lots of these kind of examples so like this one here if you know one Brit saying you know sorry are you in the queue oh oh no I'm not sorry oh sorry you know and they both laugh uncontrollably with relief because it's just been so embarrassing actually asking someone else if they are in the queue as well and um, and the sort of nervous tension about this and you know it, it's just some Brits just find that sort of unbearable having to sort of put them that have to, to talk to a total stranger about something like this so laughter is a great medicine for 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 relieving tension so being polite is also um very important this is you know making making small talk with people so um being able to chat about the weather um, it, we talk endlessly in, in the UK and, uh, and in England particularly, we talk endlessly about the weather because it's something that we all share and we all have in, in common. So um, it's, it's very much the sort of topic that you can talk about with anyone and um, no matter who they are. So becoming a, a sort of um, master of small talk, I think, is, is a very uh, important attribute in, in the UK society. So. So try and do a bit more listening and a bit less talking. So ask people about themselves um, rather than just insisting on, on telling them about you. And we have a phrase here, mind your P's and Q's, which stands for pleases and thank yous. So, um, and in many cultures, you know, the to, to buying habit, for example, might be very different. So um, people don't use pleases and thank yous in a transaction in the shop, but we do here. And if people don't know that, you know, A, that you're from another country or B, that perhaps in your country, you don't use a lot of pleases and thank yous, they might think you were being rude because you didn't acknowledge, you know, them in the transaction, you didn't say please and thank you to them. So, um, so and likewise with queuing, in England, queuing is very important and it's important that people stand in a line and, um, and you don't try to jump to the front of the queue. So when the bus comes, you adopt very much this sort of line on the, on the blue square rather than this sort of gang of people all trying to get on the bus at the same time. And you'll find that if you do try to jump the queue, that somebody will sort of frown at you and they'll be tut tut about, about the, what you're doing. Um, and usually one or two people will say, oi, there's a queue here in a sort of angry voice. And then you have to say, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm so sorry. And then go back to the back of the queue and queue behind everyone else. 
Nobody ever used to call you out on queue jumping. Everybody would just give you death stares. But um, I noticed that the English have got braver about this <laughs> and they, uh, they do now call you out on it. Oops. So, so we might just put your mics on for a second and, and let's just, you know, talk about what do you think is the motivation behind all these characteristics and also what might be some of the downsides of them. <laughs> okay, so what's it like in the office? Have any of you watched the TV show, The Office? No, okay, well, probably don't now because it will scare you. So, so. <laughs> it's a comedy show about a lot of these behaviors, but taken to their sort of full extreme. So, um, um, it, it, you know, it's amusing, but it is a comedy show. Do remember it. So, <laughs> so where management style is affected by these behaviors is this very non hierarchical. Everyone's it's much more egalitarian. So when you think about people having, you know, standing in a queue for the bus and there being particular rules and things like that, everyone is important. Everyone is as equally important. There is a hierarchy in the UK, but bigger than the hierarchy is the fact that everyone is, is equally important and everyone's opinion matters. So in a workplace, it's not very hierarchical. All um, managers are called by their first names. And, um, and everyone's input is not only, um, not only respected, but expected as well. So when the manager says around the table, you know, to anyone on the team, you know, has anyone got any more thoughts that they want to contribute or, you know, ideas about how we might develop this idea? they really mean that they really mean that they want a contribution from you they're not just sort of saying so and being friendly um so consensus is important so that everybody actually then owns the decision that has been reached but unlike for example many of the, the um scandinavian countries where consensus is so important that discussions go on and on and on until everybody around the table is comfortable with the outcome in the UK, the focus is, I'd say, more on having the result and actually getting on with it, not just having endless discussions or endless options or somebody saying, oh, well, you know, perhaps if we take this out, you know, I'd be happy with that. And then someone says, oh, yes, but I need to put this in. It's like, no, you know, this is what we've got to work with. If eight out of 10 people are happy with it, then we will go with that. So, but there is plenty of time for everybody to, to have their, to make some input, to make their thoughts known. And, um, and I say, not only is that um, um, not, you know, respected, but also very much expected. And your manager would be disappointed if he constantly, he or she constantly asked you for input and you didn't actually provide any. So there are different styles of leadership, of course, and some of you might be familiar with a very different style um, to the one that typically we see in England. Um, so, you know, whether the communication focuses on sort of asking people to do things or actually telling them to do things. So um, whether the sort of leadership style is much more about coaching and helping people to sort of to get the best out of them or whether it's just, well, I'm, these are the jobs that need doing and I'm going to tell you what to do and I just want you to get on with them. You can see already probably from what I've told you that we are very much on the left hand side of this box. So leadership is very much about helping people be the best that they can be. So it's not about, I want you to do this for me because there's a simple task and you need to just do it and not ask questions. So it's not about issuing instructions. It's about making the employee feel that they want to be part of this activity, this action, this program, whatever it is. So, and that people, the, the leader is going to be always concerned that everybody is happy with the way things are in the workplace, rather than saying, look, I'm the boss around here and what I say goes, and if you don't like it, well then get lost and you know go and work for someone else. 
So it is much more nurturing and inclusive and the communication is all about bringing people in and getting people all feeling sort of that they are working together to the same purpose. So that's not the same as them being a very familiar leadership. So in, in cultures like India, for example, the, um, the boss is both very, it's very hierarchical, but the boss is also like a father figure and ask lots of personal questions about, you know, about your family and, and your health and so on. It isn't like that here. People won't, your managers will not ask you about your personal life, but within the workplace, they want to know that you are happy and that you are, you know, getting on well with your colleagues and that you are feeling that you, you are, you know, that you are comfortable and you are belonging here. So I guess for some of you, this means that your boss may not behave like a boss. <laughs> and uh, certainly they um, would expect to be called by their first name, always, never sort of Mr. or Mrs. or Doctor or anything like that. They'll often use humour, you know, as I said, to sort of to self-deprecate, to break up tension, or perhaps to criticise in a very informal way. So you might give them a report and they're like, ah, Okay, we've finally got the report. I was thinking that maybe sometime next year you might be bringing it. And that's their way of saying that you've been quite slow with getting the report. But they don't want to actually be too direct and say, look, you know, you're pretty slow with that because perhaps they're giving you the benefit of the doubt. And maybe if you keep being slow with work, then you will sit down and have a proper talk about it. But this is just a way to say, yeah, this is quite slow actually. Um, and so that you take that on board. Another technique that um, managers often do, and well, not just managers, but <laughs> people like my mother-in-law too, is the use of a third person. So when they want to tell you to do something, but they don't actually want to give you an instruction, because as per the previous slide, that's not the sort of British way. I wonder if we might, so let's say you have been developing an idea. You go to your boss and you say, well, these are the ideas that I've had for increasing our sales of our plastic tubing, whatever. And your boss says, hmm, and likes some aspects of the idea, but will say something like, hmm, I wonder if we might. But when they say we, they don't actually mean we, they mean you. But again, they don't want to be too aggressive in their demand. So they use this sort of third person to, to sugar the pill, if you like. So, and similarly, orders are always given as suggestions rather than orders. You know, perhaps you could, I wonder if you did, uh, I wonder if you would have time to look at this report for me before the next meeting. That basically means, will you read the report and tell me what it says before the next meeting? But by asking nicely, it's a much more sort of concern for you and not being, it's taking a, a big sort of effort not to treat you like a, an inferior. And, um, and they, you know, I think your managers will always assume the best of you rather than assuming the worst and hoping for the best. So they will assume that you are trying your hardest. And if something is done badly, they will assume that, well, you have tried. Um, it's not that you are just, you know, lazy or couldn't care less. So, but there was a misunderstanding somewhere along the line. So, um, so don't ever, I don't think you should ever feel afraid to go to your boss to say, I don't quite understand what is required of me. Because as you've seen, you know, speaking really clearly and, and, um, and directly is, is not a forte of, of English leaders. So if you come out of a meeting thinking, does that mean I'm, I did a good thing or a bad thing? Um, don't feel bad about going back and asking for more clarity about that. Um, it, it, they wouldn't be, I'm sure they would not be offended if you did so. So the way that managers motivate their staff is to be available to them because we have this sort of, you know, very non-hierarchical management style here. There is no 
suggestion that the manager sits in their office and the door is shut and you have to make an appointment to see them. There's always this sort of open door policy. Increasingly, people have got open plan offices. And of course, now we're all on Zoom so much of the time that has changed the dynamic again. But the open door policy on Zoom basically means, you know, you can set up a call anytime you have something that you want to discuss with your boss. So the same way that if you were in an office, your manager's door would be open and you could just lean, go and lean on the door frame and say, do you have a minute? Can I just talk to you for a few minutes about, about this? And it's just unlike in, in more hierarchical cultures where you have to make an appointment to go and see your boss. Or, you know, in places like Indonesia and, and Japan, you wouldn't even think of going to see your boss to talk about something. You would see someone who would see someone who would see someone. And, you know, the person at the top would then sort of only talk to the person who was one level below them and not sort of five or six levels below them. So, um, so you know, this is a way of, of um, again, reinforcing the fact that there isn't this hierarchy, but there's a manager to always be there and sort of offering encouragement to, to you and encouraging you to, to sort of stretch your wings a bit. So there's very little micromanagement. Nobody is going to lean over your shoulder and say, this is what I want done and this is how I want it doing. It's up to you. They're going to say, um, Marilena, like I, I, you know, I need you to write a report about uh, what we've done um, in the last six weeks with our colleagues in in Romania, and um, and you know, and I, you know, maybe I wanted sort of three or four pages, sort of a thousand words or something like that. See what you can come up with, and that is as detailed a brief as you are going to get. So. If you're not comfortable with that, go back and ask for a bit more information about what they want. But the UK style is very much to give you a, a few words of, of uh, you know, to, to request a task from you and then see what you come up with. So there is um, a, a very much a strong understanding that it's OK to learn from mistakes. If there's a huge hurry, obviously, that it is not helpful, but generally that you will develop as a professional if you are allowed to make a few mistakes and learn from them. So, and, and so being micromanaged doesn't actually help you to develop your own strengths. It only helps you to become a, a good obedient staff member. And that's not what British managers are wanting. So the feedback sandwich will often be used here that they'll praise something you do slight area of that needs improvement but then again feedback you know we're reinforcing you know I'm very happy with you maybe a little bit more attention to detail and getting you know your spelling checked sort of but overall you know I think you're making great progress so so managers want you to like them they want you to respect them because they're your manager but they also want you to like them then the the concern is that everybody in the workplace is engaged and, and wants to be there because those sort of happy individuals create a much more productive workforce and, uh, and they are, you know, happy as in if they're happy individuals, they're also happy to be part of a strong team. And that is a team that actually gets results. You can't force people to be happy. You, you know, and you can't force them to respect the workplace. You have to give them the opportunity to grow. And, um, and I would say that, you know, a lot of the time it doesn't work nearly as well as managers like to think it does. Because unfortunately there are a lot of not very good managers out there. So a lot of, you know, something like 80% of managers think that they're doing a really good job and only about 30% of employees think that their managers are. But if you're, your manager may be getting things wrong, but um, this is really what they are trying to achieve here. So um, with office relationships, you know, I've spoken a bit about how people are quite friendly, but it stays in the office. Maybe once a week when people are working in the office, people might go out for a drink after work and uh, on a Thursday or Friday night. And, um, 
the ones who are in relationships might stay for one or two drinks and the ones who are not in relationships and have not no, no, no baby to get bath at home they will tend to to stay later and you know turn into a whole sort of evening but there's an expectation that people are friendly and that they share limited personal time but not particularly beyond that and the, the picture of the birthday party is because I was working with a Brazilian guy the other um, was last year and he was moving over to England and he said oh the last weekend that they were in Brazil he said oh we, are, we have my daughter's fifth birthday party and uh, he said all the colleagues from the office are coming to the party and I said well don't expect that here because that is a very sort of Brazilian it's a very Mediterranean thing that, that your the overlap of business and personal is much tighter than here and people do go out and socialize with their work colleagues and um, uh, and they spend a lot of personal time together with them here you enjoy spending time with your colleagues at work and there is limited sort of overlap but but nothing like in those countries so so it's the job first and then the relationships second so you go out and you start talking to a client about doing new work uh, doing you know a project for them the most important thing is to establish that you have the ability to to, to do the job so yes you're going to make um sort of build a bit of rapport and establish a bit of a connection we're like talking in small talks sort of for a bit but in in the of business it is actually showing that you can do the job first and then the relationship whereas I'm sure you know you know in many other cultures the emphasis is on building your relationship first and you spend time having dinners and playing golf and and you know doing whatever it is that you need to do spending time together before they would even consider raising the subject of, of business and before your potential client would even consider talking about it. So, so we are courteous and friendly first. And, uh, and another thing that's important for you to remember is that experience is really valued here. And I would say that experience is valid equally to academic qualifications. So, um, and I, I lived in Australia for a, a long time and I, I really liked that about there that I used to um, be able to to work with people where they would say oh well you know in Germany unless you had a, you know for example in my area of work you know in Germany unless you have a master's in intercultural studies people are not really interested in hiring you to to work as an intercultural trainer whereas I think well I have a whole lifetime's experience of being an expat and you know and I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of expats. And I think I have far more to, to bring to the table than someone who's just graduated last year. But the qualification is the most important. And here it isn't. There are a lot of really successful business people who have very little academic qualifications. And it's the ability to do the job is more important to um, than anything. Um, just a final point on office relationships as you would expect from a culture where there, there isn't a sort of much overlap of business and personal, don't bring your personal feelings into a business argument either. The argument has got to remain neutral. As soon as you start to lose your temper, to take things personally, to be offended, to start to think they don't like my idea, therefore they don't like me, you have lost the argument. It's got to be not personal. It doesn't mean that you have to behave as though you don't know what the outcome is, but don't get all sort of hysterical about things and sort of out at people and things like that. That will will completely sort of lose um, people's respect. People will not have respect for you if you if you behave like that. I hope you're all writing down questions. I'm sure that I'm hopefully provoking them. So um, a, a few tips about sort of etiquette um, and um, the English are, are, are quite conscious of, of timekeeping, um, but it's okay sort of five minutes sort of flex on time, particularly again, you know, if we're back on 
actually going places for meetings. Traffic is, is a real problem in the UK. Um, so the important thing is to let people know if you're running late. So, um, and you know, even five minutes, it's not sort of a major thing, but you should try to obviously be there on time. But if you're going to be more than about five minutes late, you should ring ahead to say, I'm sorry, I'm in a traffic jam or I've missed the train or whatever it is. So, um, and, um, uh, and, and try to get there as quickly as possible. So because of our sort of lack of hierarchy here, offices are very open and, and shared a lot of open plan, hot desking, that sort of thing is becoming more and more common and everybody of different levels of seniority are all sort of sitting down together. And, um, and they share the facilities like the kitchen and so on, and everybody cleans up their own cup and puts their own cup in the dishwasher and nobody makes coffee for anyone else. And these kind of things, it's interesting, you know, it's often these little these small things that can cause a lot of tension between people. And um, that, you know, people leaving their cup on the side for someone else to put in the dishwasher because that person comes from a culture where perhaps, it, you know, two or three times a day, somebody comes around and cleans up the kitchen after everybody else. So I remember a, a, a French client of mine who moved to India and he said, you know, twice a day, the, the tea boy would come around with the trolley and would serve up really awful coffee that Francois, you know, just couldn't bear to drink. And then he thought, well, you know, how can I resolve this? Because I really want to be able to have my own little Nespresso machine and be able to make my own coffee the way that I like it. But I will offend the tea boy if I do that. So, so that what he did was he brought his machine in and then when the boy came in with the tea, he asked him to make a coffee for him, but using his machine. So honor was sort of maintained. Uh, Francois got the coffee he wanted, but the tea boy didn't feel like he was sort of being take, take, taken out of a job. So there are lots of little changes that can be made like that, that where you sort of acknowledge the role of other people, you acknowledge the behavior that is important to them and you find a way to adapt your own behavior to, um, to sort of fit in with that. So um, there is, you know, as I said, there's limited sort of socializing, maybe a couple of times a year, you might go out with your team for a meal or something like that. And it's a perfectly lovely evening and they'll be socializing and sharing some sort of personal information about your family and talking about all kinds of things. But, but people don't share and don't expect to be asked about very personal things like how much money they earn or who they vote for. There are some topics here that are sort of quite taboo. So, um, and those are probably the two most important ones. And again, you know, this varies enormously in, in, in different cultures, but here people are not comfortable talking about money. They don't want to be asked, you know, how much rent they pay, how much they earn, um, you know, how much any particular piece of clothing costs, anything like that. You just don't talk about money with people until you know them very well. If you go to the pub, um, when it's your turn to buy drinks, it's known as buying around, and people will say to you, oh, "It's your turn to, you know, to buy around." If you don't drink alcohol, that, that's fine. There are lots of alcohol-free alternatives available, and I don't think people would look down on you for for not being a drinker, unless perhaps you were a young single male, um, where there I think is more pressure on you to drink. But generally, people wouldn't care less. So. It's seen as very bad behavior to stay in the pub and have, for example, three drinks bought for you, but then leaving when it's your turn and not buying a drink sort of in return. So a, a common sort of team activity here is to, you know, is to go out for a curry or something like that, to go out for a meal. And unless you have been told that the boss or the company is paying, the expectation is that the bill is divided and everyone pays for their share because it's a sort of encouraging social um, to people to socialize. And I would say at least one of those two times the company would pay, but, um, but the, you, you shouldn't assume that it will be paid. So usually what happens is maybe you will buy your own food, but you know, the company will pay for all the drinks or something like that. So at these kind of occasions, you, there isn't much work talk. There shouldn't be. Don't try to bring in work talk or work topics 
this is a social occasion and uh, should be enjoyed just as that. And this is, you know, work-life balance is very much about keeping, in the UK, is about keeping your work and the rest of your life separate and having an equal amount of both. So um, it would feel like an infringement on people's personal lives if you wanted to ring them um, at antisocial hours, you know, perhaps, you know, after sort of 6, 30, 7 p.m. If you wanted to ring people at home to talk about work issues or you rang them over the weekends. Um, I remember an, an Indian manager that I worked with um, again in Australia and after he'd been in, the, in Australia for a few months, I asked him how he was getting on and he said, oh, it's, it's just terrible. He said, the Australians are so lazy and, and I found them just impossible to motivate. And I said, well, what are some of the things that you're doing to motivate them? And he said, well, for example, he said, you know, I had this great idea that would be really good for the team to work on. And, uh, and he said, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll call them at nine o'clock and it'll just go to voicemail and then I email them and then you know, they don't come back to me till the following morning. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, because in Australia, nine o'clock is well into personal time. And, uh, you know, unless the house is on fire, basically, they don't want to hear from their boss. So, and, you know, he just had no concept that people would sort of have on and off switches. In India, it is much more common for young people to be on all the time. And, uh, and they sort of pay potentially quite a high price for that but in return their boss looks after them and makes sure that they are amply rewarded. So. Um, just in terms of meetings, um, quite a difference and again this has you know changed a lot since, since Covid and so much more Zoom like it, it, all meeting etiquette has sort of gone out of the window I think with with since Zoom so um, you know and I think that's quite, you know, detrimental. So we used to see a lot of difference between internal and external meetings. So external meetings being, you know, client facing much more formal. People would always turn up on time, wouldn't bring food and drink and so on. And, um, you know, would, would be there before the client arrived. So internally um, a lot of people sort of come in and you know they struggle in they bring drinks they bring sandwiches and things like that there's quite a bit of sort of chit chat before the meeting gets starts so um, but once you get down to it there is a sort of focus on process and results so again you know in many other cultures they will have a meeting and they will just not get to the to a result but it's like well you know but it's three o'clock so um, you know we just have to leave um in Portugal they will meet and they will stay in a meeting until they have found the you know the solution that they're after and it might take hours so <laughs> here it's like well the meeting is scheduled for two to three and you know we really want to get an outcome by the end of it so if people go off on tangents they will be brought back to come on we've got to focus on this and um we've got to sort of have a decision you know on this by three o'clock so one of the things you might notice here is that there is not always a plan B. So the decision will be made to pursue a particular line of, of activity. And if that doesn't work, well, then it's back to the drawing board and let's try something else. Um, but there isn't necessarily a, a need to have a sort of plan B ready in the wings. People will have an idea of what they might do instead, but they won't have sort of fleshed out that idea. It'll just be sort of a concept. So, because actually um, it's quite feasible that plan A will work well anyway, and you won't need um, you won't need your plan B. But again, you know, I find countries like Germany and Holland and the Netherlands, you know, they, they really have a plan A and a plan B, and they think it's risky to not do that. So, Formal meetings, they will adhere to sort of, you know, agenda and, and as I said, the discussion is controlled um, by whoever is running, it might be a, you know, chairperson or just, you know, the manager. So, but make sure you get your points across. If you've got ideas, don't wait to be asked. If you have something to say, you know, you can, whatever the etiquette is within the meeting, you put your hand up or, you know, you make sure that it is known um, because 
but people won't necessarily ask you, partly because they don't want to sort of put you on the spot. So if if you haven't actually said, you know, I've, I've got you know some some a contribution to make here, or I've got an idea about this, they won't they won't. It's not school, you know. They won't call you out and sort of say, well, you know, Sonia, what do you think about this? Because actually, they just assume that if you've got something to say, that you will say it. So if you have got something to say, make sure that you uh, you are heard and don't worry about interrupting someone else because that is also very common. So um, you can add on, you can flesh out someone else's idea. It doesn't mean that you're sort of stealing their idea. It's actually showing that you are part of a team and, and that you see that working in this way, um, you know, you are contributing to the good of the team as a whole. But do, as I say, remember to avoid sort of being too emotional in your argument and, and trying to sort of oversell and overhype something and make sure that your ideas are, are grounded and sort of evidence-based, not just sort of pie in the sky, unless, unless you're in a, a brainstorm, um, unless uh, at which point um, pie in the sky is always welcome. So. Um, presentations often start with a joke here. Um, but that's something that perhaps um, you should leave until you have mastered that because um, jokes are notoriously, humour is notoriously difficult to, um, to get across in a second language. So, um, and it may surprise you that a serious presentation will be started with a joke as an icebreaker, but it is the British way to sort of combine a bit of humour and to to be a little bit lighthearted about this and, and not take it all too seriously. And we present a big picture. So, you know, notice I'm not giving you a whole list of scenarios when in this happened, you must do this. And if this happens, you must do that. So um, I'm giving you a sort of big picture and, um, and then even something like a sort of technical presentation about, um, about a new machine it will be big concepts about what the machine is capable of doing. And then there will be appendices um, handed out to people, or emailed to people with all the technical specifications. So um, expect people to, to question you and to interrupt you while you are making your presentation. Um, and, um, and expect also that even though you might really love your idea and think it's absolutely fantastic, um, the response might be a bit muted you know, sort of, and a lot of, hmm, interesting, <laughs> back at you. Uh, finally, you know, I, we, you need to be aware that English hate conflict. They will run a mile from conflict. So if you try to pick an argument with someone about something, you've got to do it as though you really don't care about the outcome. So, because um, if they can, if they sense that, you know, that there's a sort of fight brewing, they will run a mile. And um, th there's an expression here that when something is not liked, people sort of talk about sweeping it under the rug. And if you think about sort of dust and dog fur and things like that, gathering around the edge of your carpet, and um, you know somebody comes along and instead of actually just cleaning it up, they just sweep it under the rug so that it can't be seen. And that's exactly what the British like to do with conflict. So they don't, they always take it personally and they always dislike it. So, um, so they're sort of, if there's a, a sort of hint of trouble brewing, people will try to sort of damp it down. They will make a joke. They will, um, you know, just try to lighten the, the atmosphere. So. And if you come across in any way, sort of, you know, a bit ready for a fight, that people will not engage with you. It will be an unhappy experience for everybody. So the, the English way is very much for there to be a win-win. They want everybody sort of to be happy that it's not fair otherwise, if, you know, and not a kind of people who want to win-lose that, you know, I'm going to get it and you're going to get nothing. That's not the way. So if you feel that things are going that way, then there's a misunderstanding somewhere because that is very atypical of a sort of British way. We say, actually, we want everyone to be, to feel that they are, you know, happy here. So, um, and because of this dislike of conflict and of sort of rocking the boat, you'll find that many people will prefer to sort of grumble about things and to complain about things rather than actually doing something about it. And, um, and if you are the type of person who actually says, well, hang on a sec, you know, this isn't fair. 
other people are like, oh, well, well, don't worry about it, you know, sort of. So, um, uh, so um, you have to decide really whether the argument is worth taking on or, um, you know, whether it might be more problems for you than it is actually worth. It's funny, you know, I just want to say about networking because the English are very friendly. You might feel that they are quite difficult to, to get to know because of all this sort of perhaps, you know, duplicity about not telling you what they, um, what they really sort of think about. But I think that one of the th things that I really like about English people is that they actually are, they do, they are concerned about other people and they do want to be helpful. And, um, and if you ask for help, they will try to give it to you. So when you go into a, as if you go to a networking, you go to a, an event or you network online on, you know, on LinkedIn, things like that, ask people for the help. And don't necessarily just, you know, be asking for a job, but asking for advice. You know, do they know someone else that they could connect you with? Um, make yourself memorable without being pushy. Tell us some story about yourself that helps them to remember you. It's not, networking is not about who you know. It's about who knows you. So if you're looking for a job, the more people who you know that know you are looking for a job, they are your sales team. And they will get out there and sort of sell your story and and your you know the benefits of hiring you for you. And if you do meet someone for a coffee or something like that, always follow up afterwards. You know, thanks for those leads. I met with so and so afterwards, and keep it really personal. The more you can personalize the relationship with people, the better. And uh, it really does sort of pay off. And I. I put here kiss frogs, which is <laughs> my reminder to say, you know, you just never know who knows somebody else. And it may be that you kiss, you know, several frogs, but then one of them actually turns into a prince or one of them knows a prince or a princess, you know, whatever you are looking for. And, you know, you, you just have to go out there with a really open mind and, um, and, and see what comes up. And don't be afraid to approach anyone you know, the, think of the most successful business people in the UK are people like Richard Branson, who, you know, didn't even finish school. So nobody is going to look down on you. You may be concerned over lack of qualifications. They are looking beyond that. What they really want is to surround themselves with people that they enjoy working with, who have got um, ideas and enthusiasm to contribute. Having perfect English is not the most <coughs> important thing that um, people celebrate and I think really enjoy diversity of perspective here. And if you can show that you can offer that, um, I, I think you would be, a, you know, makes you a very attractive proposition. The other thing I'd really say is if you're worried about somebody that, you know, there are reasons why somebody might not hire you, have a really, <laughs> have a good conversation with, you know, yourself or ideally, you know, with a, with a sort of a, a friend or a, a colleague or something like that and say, you know, I'm really worried that they might not recognize my qualifications here um, and therefore they might not hire you. And you actually, you know, raise that in your interview and put it back at them that you might be concerned that, you know, my, I don't have any experience in the UK. I've only got experience in South Africa, for example. But I can tell you why this is actually an advantage for you, because I'm going to be able to bring a whole load of new experiences to the job here that other people won't have. So I can give you a perspective from a different market or, you know, whatever the, the issue is, own it and find a positive spin for it and bring that to the table rather than letting them not hire you because they've thought about this thing, but they haven't actually mentioned it to you. Whoops, so, okay. So um, you've seen on no doubt these signs, you know, keep calm and carry on and there's a whole range of them. So hopefully this is gonna use here and I can't keep calm because I've got the job. But, you know, key takeaways for me was always follow up by email and network, network, network. If you need help, you know, further help, find out where you can get it from. Maybe think about getting some coaching to help you. And um, 
feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and uh, and I often post stuff and share stuff that other people have posted about, you know, job search and things like that. So um, if I can help you in any way, I'd be very happy to, to do so. So I'm going to stop the share and I hope uh, we'll have a bit of a discussion now. So thank you for listening.